At a friend's house in about second grade, I remember first playing Mario Tennis for the Nintendo 64. Fast forward a year, and my neighborhood friends regularly incorporated Mario Tennis in the games we would usually play, with Mario Party, Mario Kart, Super Smash Bros., and SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom. And yeah, I'm not so sure how that one got into the list either, but anyway, Throughout the couple of Mario Tennis games I've gotten, the Camelot logo appeared pretty consistently, but as a kid, I just ignored it. When replaying Mario Tennis Power Tour, one of my favorites, this is when I should probably look into who these guys were. In 1990, a division in Sega called Camelot was founded known as Sega CD4, or Consumer Development Studio No. 4. For a while, they developed exclusively for Sega, and one of the most well-known works for them was the Shining Force series which was a fantasy turn-based RPG for the Sega Mega Drive. In 1995, the company split from Sega, but agreed to keep making the Shining series. By the time of Shining Force 3, they were operating under the name of Camelot Software Planning. After the issues with the Sega Saturn, Camelot moved from Sega completely and started to work for Nintendo. Now this company went on to create some of my favorite games for the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance, and I'm here to talk about one of the most critically acclaimed RPGs in gaming, Golden Sun. There's a reason why this game is superb, and I wanted to find out for myself. Also, if you love Waluigi, you can thank Camelot for that too. And as a heads up, I won't spoil any big parts of the story, but there will be a few minor spoilers throughout the review. Golden Sun is set in the fantasy world of Weyard, an environment with a couple major continents and oceans. Everything on Weyard consists of four elements, Venus, Mercury, Mars, and Jupiter, or Earth, Water, Fire, and Wind. These blocks can be manipulated by the omnipotent force of alchemy, which was dominant in the past. Because of this, alchemy was sealed and the world became devoid of this power, or so one would think. Scattered throughout Weyard are these individuals who can manipulate this power through a form of magic called synergy. These wielders are known as adepts, and they usually refuse to show this power to the outsiders. Now the story starts with a bang. After the worldwide conflict of Weyard's ancient past and alchemy was sealed, the keys to unlock this power were kept at Mount Elf, which is guarded by the town of Vale. Two individuals named Satoros and Minardi storm the mountain trying to steal the stars for themselves, but they fail at the riddles and are driven away by a magically generated thunderstorm and rock slide. Fast forward three years. Satoru and Minardi are at it again, this time with the help of Felix, who plays a bigger role in the sequel, and Alex, a mysterious individual who seems to have a better understanding of what's going on than the others. They hold Jenna and Kraden hostage, but before they can get all the elemental stars from Isaac, the volcano erupts. The Wise One, the guardian of Mount Elf, shows up before Isaac and Garrett to task them with stopping the lighthouses from being awakened. By doing so, alchemy will be restored and the period of unbalance will return. Now it's time to meet the cast who is set on stopping alchemy from coming back, and we're going to start off with Isaac, 17 year old Venus adept and the silent protagonist in this Golden Sun game. As you explore the world of Weyard, his sprite is the one that you are seeing. His main synergies are Move, a very important synergy to complete the dungeon puzzles, and Retreat, which is pretty self explanatory. He's a leader of the party, but he's not on this journey alone. Joining him is his best friend Garrett, a 17 year old Mars adept. He might not have as much speed as Isaac, but he hits harder. He can also use the move synergy like Isaac, and he's related to the mayor of Vale. From there they meet Ivan, a 15 year old Jupiter adept, who is known as the mage of the team. Because he doesn't have the strength of Isaac or Garrett, he makes up for it in his magic ability. His strong Jupiter synergy of the Ray and Plasm series with the addition of his high speed stat makes him feel like a glass cannon, but he's still a strong team member. And last of the team is Mia a 16 year old Mercury Adept, and she's kind of the healer of the team from the town of Emil. She's the last member to join the team, and she's related to Alex. Like Ivan, she doesn't ne nearly hit as hard as Isaac and Garrett, but her healing ability more than makes up for it. She can do well also when she's on the offensive, but she was mainly bred for that healer kind of role. One of the most brilliant parts of this game in my opinion is the battle system. On the surface, it's a simple turn-based battle system. Throughout your adventure, you can buy or find weapons and armor to increase your base stats. Like normal RPGs, nothing new there. The different members in your party are almost auto-assigned to roles, like a tank, a healer, and a mage. Each of them have a, has a strong affinity to one of the elements as well. Where the brilliance comes in is the Jin system. 
The Jin system is where you can make your gameplay very unique. Jins can do both increase the stats of your party members and give them access to different, more powerful attacks in battle. These creatures can also be left idle to unleash powerful summons. If that wasn't enough, they can also be used by themselves to give defense upgrades, restore health, etc. These Jins allow for each person to approach the battle system a lot differently than you would originally think. You can stretch out battles and consistently heal, risk it all in the beginning by unleashing powerful summons, or mix and match the unique abilities of the Jins to fit the battle situation of the time. It is confusing, but this makes finding Jins throughout the game extremely important, and that's another part that I love about this game. The first thing to point out is that these creatures are adorable. They just kind of sway back and forth and hang out, waiting for you to get to them in some cases. One of the ways you can find them is if you look beyond what you have to do just to find the path forward. Puzzles and dungeons are scattered throughout the game, and you usually find these little guys hanging out on a ledge you can't get to yet. They can also be hiding in the overworld in a suspicious area, so you might have to battle these creatures to use them, but they make a powerful addition to the party. I always had fun finding these guys, and seeing them in the overworld just hanging out just like they belong there, it's really nice to see. Now I'm going to talk about some of these aspects that I also like, besides just the battle system. And one of them is the mind read synergy. In many traditional RPGs, any NPC you talk to can give you some information about the town you are exploring, or, you know, just normal, normal conversations when you talk to them. But recently I've noticed in some RPGs, they've tried to implement systems that go beyond that. And Xenoblade Chronicles did this to an amazing extent. After talking with others in the game, a different line of dialogue will be shown depending on if it's the first time you've talked to them or not. In my mind, this gives a lot more depth to the characters and their relationships as well. When Mind Read is used in Golden Sun, you have the potential to see other characters mean the exact opposite of what they initially said. Using your own interpretation, you can see them doubting, excited, or even confused about the situation going on in the town. Can I remind you they were able to do this in a Game Boy Advance game? While some people might not appreciate this as much, it does a lot for me when I play the game. A part that's probably a fan favorite and another of one of my favorites as well is the Colossal section. In this section of the game, Isaac competes in an arena-like setting with other warriors to display their strength and intellect. If you win or place high enough, you're offered to be soldiers or bodyguards in Babby's Palace. I won't say a lot about him in general, but he is old with a lot of plot significance. I didn't realize how much fun this competition would be. You don't have your normal equipped gear, and you're tasked with making up for it with quick thinking and puzzle solving optimization. It was very frustrating because one mistake can completely mess you up, but I love that in games. I play a lot of Fire Emblem games, and permadeath is one of my favorite mechanics. You might have to retry a couple of times to get through the competition, but I enjoyed every second of it. If you know me, I'm always a sucker for an amazing soundtrack. While I've heard better soundtracks from other RPGs I've played, this one still impresses me a lot. The towns all feel unique and it's partially due to the music. A huge part of the game experience relies on the music to invoke a certain feeling from the player, and Golden Sun achieves this very well. No music feels out of place, and the soundtrack had a wide variety from intense boss battles to relaxing towns. In my mind, it's a strength of the game that can be easily overlooked. This game blew me away on almost every level. While I've heard others call the story basic for going the route of the four elements, I praised it for not following the predictable gather up the four elemental stars and defeat the boss. More of that development is in the sequel though. The staples of a traditional RPG were there, with exploration, combat, finding random items and branching pathways, etc. One critique that is common though is the auto-defense part of the battle system. If multiple people in your party attack the same enemy, and it dies without the, all the attacks going through, the other unit will defend automatically. In most RPGs, the move will just redirect to a different target. One game that doesn't redirect the attacks is the original Final Fantasy. It seems like this shouldn't be a part of RPGs especially because it was way ahead of its time, 
on so many other aspects. I don't mind that this happens much, but it's very frustrating on easy fights. My other critique was on the random encounters. While it isn't as bad as other RPGs I've played recently, it is something that can easily take you out of the experience. To avoid these enemies, you can use an item called Sacred Feathers, or a synergy called Avoid. The Sacred Feathers were a nice addition, but there is no upgrade to it. Over time, you would get an Avoid synergy, but it didn't last very long either. One of my favorite parts of RPGs is exploration, therefore I like any addition to turn off wild encounters after a while. They have it in Golden Sun, but it's not nearly long enough. I found myself constantly reopening the menu to reapply the Avoid synergy, or use another Sacred Feather to ignore useless battles. For a game made for the Game Boy Advance in 2001, this game blew me away. It had everything from an incredibly in-depth battle system to a complex story, both of which that defied all expectations for the hardware limitations of the time. I liked the music, the exploration, and all the extra witty lines of dialogue from the random townsfolk. While it's not my favorite RPG I've ever played, and I've played a lot, it definitely competes with some of the ones that nostalgia favors in my mind. I can see the care that Camelot put in this game, and it saddens me that there's only three Golden Sun games out there. I got this game on the Wii U eShop for about $8 and I would have paid way more for it considering the level of enjoyment I got out of it. If you're on the edge and you're a fan of RPGs, I'd say go for it. It's a game that was way ahead of its time and will give you an incredibly enjoyable experience.